Hello, everyone, and welcome to Screen Hype. I today am joined by a very special guest, Ivan Brett from The Traitors. Ivan, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Nice to be here. No, I'm honestly so, so excited when you agreed to this because I was not expecting to love the show as much as I did. And I think that's just been such a huge thing. Like, I've not seen a show have this much hype in such a long time. So did you realise when you were filming just how super popular it was going to get? There were indications that they were they were trying to make it a big thing. I mean, I, I've never seen a I haven't done a lot of TV, but I've never seen a cast that big. And everything felt sort of budget wise, everything felt quite big about it. And while it was happening, we definitely felt like it was exciting. It was it was fun, but it was just us. So we were never quite, um, you know, we never knew that people would take to it the way they did. And actually, in a way, we sort of thought, oh, should we have been more horrible to each other? Should we have acted outside of what we really wanted to do and sort of been a bit less natural? But in the end, I think it was the, the natural way in which we spoke to each other and talked to each other and made friends and then made enemies that made it such compelling watching. Yeah, definitely, because I don't usually watch reality shows, but with the traitors, I was just hooked. So do you think mm. that sort of familiarity with between all the contestants is what sets it apart from everything else? Yeah, I mean, reality is a funny word, isn't it? Because reality show is almost a moniker for a lack of that, right? Reality shows are nothing like reality. I think this is a game show, and I think it shows itself as a game show as well. If you have a reality show like um, one of these kind of semi-scripted shows where people play themselves by name but nothing else, it really, it doesn't have the same drama that ours, <coughs> excuse me, that ours had, which was essentially loads and loads of game mechanics piled up together, and then you just told to get on with it. So there was no direction, there was no reshoots, there was no, oh, do you want to go over there and start a fight with that person? So in a way, it wasn't reality, and I'm really glad about that. Going into it, I was very concerned that I was going to get wrapped up in a show like the one that we would associate with that word and it never really turned out like that so i was quite relieved i definitely get what you're saying there because it really was just something so spectacular and i've got to say i loved your exit speech it was one of my <laughs> favorite scenes of the whole show like i was gutted you were leaving because you're like my favorite character contestant but it the speech was amazing and i've got to know did you start planning it in your head when it became clear that someone's going to get you voted off or just like yeah. make it up on the spot after you were banished uh I may be a writer, but I'm not that good. Um, I, uh, I'm quite familiar with improv and coming up with good lines um, because a lot of my time during my job, I, I played D&D and as a DM, I have to make sure that I can think of, you know, cool lines that'll end a session or cool lines that'll send a character reeling. But <clears throat> the key is to know when to think of it, right? So I would hate to think that at some point I stopped fighting to save myself um, in order to try and think of a, a brilliant final line but uh, there was an element of through the day me realizing that you know, there's a magician coming for me and therefore it's all a big trick and therefore how funny it would it be if that trick went wrong so those ideas were already running through my head and then it was just a case of sitting there as people were voting and counting up the numbers and being like it's going to be between it's going to be within one or two votes and i think it's not going to go my way i need to have something so i sort of just i just chalked up a few lines i actually had more lines than i delivered but in the end i sort of edit, self-edited a little bit um and I'm so glad it went right because I have this tendency to speak really fast and gabble my lines and sort of uh, lose my head a bit. Like I do speak really fast and I have to constantly watch myself that I don't. So it, in that moment, I was shaking, I was dehydrated, my mouth was clinging together and somehow I managed to get out that final line. And I think in the end, it probably was slightly, I mean, I think parting gift was maybe the best line of the show, but I'd like to think I was second. <laughs> No, honestly, like, that was not my cut. I literally just, like, jumped out of my seat. I was like, oh, <laughs> yes, get, get him, I mean, get him. That was honestly so amazing. Can you remember any of the lines you didn't include? I'm so curious to know what else was sort of going on in your head. Well, I'm not really supposed to talk about things that weren't broadcast, but what was going on in my head was definitely a feeling of forgiveness. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that this was a game because I had treated it as such and while I'd taken it personally that morning and while my initial reaction when being put on trial and then being told you're a traitor to my face by this person who'd come out Tom who'd come out with this this big lie was emotion that emotion quickly gave way to game on here we go this is what I came for let's do this so there'd been a lot of things said on that table and and I'd said a few things which uncharacteristically mean like this is going to ruin your career and all this kind of stuff and also said stuff to Alex as well about her manipulating Tom and in the end when I stood up there what I really wanted to do was clear the air before I would potentially not see them ever again although as it's as it as it is of course we saw each other plenty after the show so the main spirit of my of, of my speech was to make sure that before I delivered any zingers 
everyone understood that this was still the game. The game was what mattered. And if anyone lost that, that's when you stopped playing well. And I hope that came across. No, I, I think it came across really tactful. Um, so <coughs> as you left relatively early, you missed out on a lot of the missions. Mm. Are there any that you sort of saw in the show that you would have really liked to do? I mean, the missions were fun. Um, and I, but I think the feeling of, of FOMO that I felt having been eliminated on day end of day four was more about the the bonds that were formed and the the kind of the tactics that were played i found in many ways the missions to be least interesting just because they weren't the game they were a means to well they, they had they were twofold weren't they that first of all a means to collect the money but second of all a means to get everyone bonding before the round table broke it up again so it was that really really effective um sort of uh peak and trough of like everyone's great everyone hates each other every single day so yeah i mean that last mission on a speedboat looked great i'd love to jump out of a helicopter um i'd love to do the mission impossible one and the bridge one looked great but actually i think the overall feeling of not being there was much more intense in terms of just wanting to be playing that game wanting to be you know neck deep in in lies and deceit and manipulation and trying to sort of navigate my way out of it and and so watching the episodes back from from five onwards, yeah, it was really painful. Um, I, I felt intensely, intensely jealous the whole time, <laughs> if I'm honest. Oh, no, because I, I um, once did an escape room that had like a laser maze when I was watching that challenge. It was reminded me of that. I was like, oh, that would have been so much fun. But yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know how good I'd be at that. Because I feel like that's something that you only find out how good you are when you actually do it. I think probably I would have like, you know, got my bum on my heel and knocked it over and then you only get one chance and it's all over and then, you know, that's it. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I think I think that would have been quite a lot of fun. I was like watching, I was like, oh, wish I was there. <laughs> but I, <laughs> well, I wasn't necessarily as, as enthused to try and join on the one had gone that like spinny wheel stood up where they spin around and said things that looked terrifying. <laughs> I was really glad they didn't put me on that one, but not because they didn't want to be upside down, though I, I didn't want to be upside down. It was because... I had noticed that um, one of my tactics for not getting murdered was do well in the tasks and make sure that people think of you as kind of like, at least in terms of earning money, indispensable. But I had also not wanted to stand out too much. And in the first mission, I'd been very vocal on that boat. And on the second mission, it happened to be music, which I'm quite good at. So I was able to read the music and tell what the song was before they played it. So when it came to day three and that, that wheel, I was thinking, I really need to take a back seat. The best way to do that would be not be picked out of the tombola. So actually, when she didn't call my name, I was relieved, but not for necessarily the reasons that most people would, I think. That actually makes a lot of sense. Now, mm. one thing I'm very curious about is if the traitors had sent an invite for you to join them, would you have accepted it? This is such an interesting question. At the time, during the game, I, I think I even thought about this and thought no. But every single fibre of my being now says, well, it makes sense. I don't really want to be a traitor. If, if I were to ever play again, I would still apply to be a faithful. I, I don't think I'd be a very good traitor. But in terms of survival, if you're offered the traitor and uh, uh, in terms of, um, uh, what do they call it, by seduction, and you don't take it, you're just going to get murdered the next day. Um, and also, as, as we saw, I don't know if you've seen the American show yet, but there's a couple of interesting things about recruitment and what happens when you announce that your people are trying to recruit you, which is also really, really dangerous. So strategy wise, simply, of course, yes, the, the optimal play is definitely to take it. But emotions wise, when you're in there, it's impossible to express how deeply we sort of harbour this hatred off the traitors, which sounds ridiculous. I just told you earlier in this interview, it's all a game. But there was something so us v them about it that if you were offered to be a traitor, it just wouldn't have felt right. I think they were feeling a lot of guilt and I was feeling a lot of guilt on their behalf, like vicariously for all the murders they had to do. And therefore it did cross my mind once, maybe on day four, because on day four, when I was on trial, I did have a thought that maybe they, that the actual trial was, do you want to get recruited as a traitor? Maybe they'll murder one, recruit the other, something like that. So I was thinking about being a traitor on that day and thinking, would I really like this job? And maybe I would have said no. I would certainly never apply to be a traitor. That just wouldn't come into it for me. That's something, I'm not sure if you're allowed to elaborate on that, but I didn't realise you like applied to be either a faithful or a traitor. I just assumed you applied to join the show and they picked randomly. So do you actually say which one you want to be then? You apply to be on the show, but there are many, many questionnaires, interviews and so on. And they ask you all the time, what role would you be? 
And my thinking was always, I want to be a faithful. So no, I didn't apply like into the faithful inbox or the traitor inbox. It's not as simple as that. But they want to know your story. They want to know your thing. And for me, I just wanted to completely get sort of overloaded with the improbability of winning when you're a faithful. It's so much more difficult for faithfuls. I think it's about 3% chance you can win if you start as a faithful, 17% chance you can win if you start as a traitor. So there's more, it's, it's more than six times more likely for you to win as a traitor. But that's why I wanted to play faithful. I think you can play faithful really, really well if you look at the numbers, if you remember lots and lots of things using something like a memory palace, and there's other strategies too. You've got so much less power that for me, it was a really interesting role to play. I think I probably, as I say, would not have been a particularly good traitor since I don't think I'm a particularly good liar. So that's the other thing. I wasn't in there to manipulate. The entire time I was in there to try and figure things out and use my own strategies to sort of like solve the game. And that's why I think I was better suited to being a faithful than a traitor. That's very interesting, actually, because when I play Among Us, I always much prefer to be a crewmate because I find it so much more fun figuring out who the imposters are than being yes. the imposter. So do you, yeah. do you, because I know you played Among Us on Twitch, do you feel the same? Well, last time we played Among Us, we played about 15 games and I wasn't once picked as imposter. I think variety is the spice of life and I think it is quite fun to be picked sometimes to do the bad stuff. But I do enjoy a mystery. I enjoy the thrill of the chase. And if you are a traitor, you know all the answers immediately and then it's just a case of hiding it. it I, I love reading murder mysteries and I, I love crime fiction. I don't particularly enjoy the endings that often. What I enjoy more is trying to figure it out. So for me, it's obvious. It's an easy choice, yeah. Now, one thing I'm very curious about is with most contestants, I was able to pinpoint what went wrong. But with you, I felt you never really made any mistakes. You just got really unlucky with Tom Gunning for you. But I'm wondering if looking back, is there anything that you felt you could have done differently? Yeah, I think if I played like uncharacteristically, I think I probably could have, got, could have got further. There were people in that show who were more intelligent than me that, that hid their intelligence much more effectively. Ryan is, is a genius. Uh, Imran uh, is a genius. And actually, despite how many times you saw in the edit, we had no idea about his, his job. Um, Alyssa is incredibly clever. Andrea used to work for the government. These people have huge, huge intelligence and managed to cloak it. And uh, cloak. And if I had potentially hidden that and been a little bit less forward about my strategizing, then maybe um, I would have not got picked up by Tom as being a traitor. The game is chaos and he could have picked anyone at that point. Um, I was trying lots and lots of things and I wasn't being quiet about my strategy. And I had a thought during the game that being onto people especially if you're onto the wrong people, is actually quite a good survival tactic. So if I if I am, con like, like Maddie was, if I'm continually going for, say, Aaron, they might not murder me because I think at some point I'll get rid of Aaron. It equally works if you're onto the right person. Maddie being on, on Wilf, if she's on him and on him and on him, it would be too dangerous for him to murder her because it would, it would leave a trail. So being actively on the hunt for traitors is not necessarily a dangerous thing. But I think the mistake I made was rather than being on the hunt for traitors, putting in place strategies that would catch traitors that made them feel uncomfortable. So I had all sorts of different things I was suggesting to people about how they would share secrets with each other and using a sort of triangle strategy format where if you wanted to share a secret with one person, you had to have one other person there as a witness to see it. So that if you got murdered because of the secret you shared, the third person had some sort of um, uh, uh, leverage to hold against you. And I reckon the traitors probably saw that and were like, don't like this at all. Um, if I hadn't been put on trial that morning, I don't think Tom would have come out and said he thought I was a traitor, because I think at the time he thought he was saving Alex. We're going very deep into the strategy here, but I think my mistake was being too visibly smart, and I don't even think I was particularly smart, maybe too visibly, like visibly smart, uh, instead of actually smart, um, about my strategy, and therefore the traitors were like, just can and can as quick as we can. That's actually very interesting because I think of all of the players, I think the reason I liked you the most as a contestant is your kind of approach to the game is very similar to how I tend to approach games because I'm very into like social mm. deduction games and things like that. Mm. So I think I saw a, saw a lot of my own tactics in you. And so when you went out so early, I was like, dang, that's, that's how I would have fared. I'm now, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to ask you a question. What is your opinion on the parting gift controversy? Do you think your own was in the right or the wrong there? I think... Whether he was within or slightly beyond the letter of the law is not for me to comment on. I think what we can all agree is that it made good TV, right? So that's what I think we should focus on here. Now, whether they change the rules in the second season or change the wording of the rules in the second season, so those things aren't necessarily 
um, allowed is a different question. But think about it. At that stage in the game, you've only got one chance. They can't, because this game was played like a game rather than played like a, a TV filming, they couldn't have said, hold up, can you just do that again, but not be so obvious about it. It is what he did. So yeah, I agree. There's a, there, there, are, there are questions to be had about how it will uh, affect future games. And I think there's a worry, certainly, if I were the one uh, now directing another series about what if everyone does that. I think they're going to have to put some sort of, I hate to say punishment, but some sort of incentive or reserve, reverse incentive in place so that that doesn't happen again. Nevertheless, it made the final a brilliant episode and we can't take that away from Kieran. I agree. I was like, I, I loved like the whole suspense at the end was brilliant because I was like, Will, Will's got this in the bag and then that happened yeah. and Will, it, it wasn't even what he said, it was the way Will reacted to it. He just went spiralling mm. and he, like, it was so brilliant to watch <laughs> Now, I have a kind of idea on how they could sort of um, attempt for that in the future season. I'm curious if you think it would work, is they could make it so that the if uh, the traitors get voted out, they still get a certain percentage of the money if a traitor wins, and that would stop them kind of betraying the other traitors. Do you think that would be a potential way to deal with it? That's that's really interesting. I really like that, actually. Um, I... I think that is good. That is an incentivized way of doing it. Equally, you could just incentivize everyone by saying, hey, as long as you play by the rules, you're going to get a certain X amount of money just as an appearance fee. I don't, yeah, I, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work, except that knowing you're going to get some sort of money might convince you that it's less important to stay in the game. So you know the way Maddie was offered £3,000. In the end, that wasn't enough. But if everyone's offered a significant amount of money, it affects the prize pot. And people might use that as their own, like, well, I'll get out now so you can stay in. It sounds interesting, but I feel like it should be a mechanic. Like, now you've reached the final, you will get that much. I don't know, does it dilute the drama of you get nothing? Perhaps. But I get what you're saying, and I think it at least means people are incentivized to keep the rules right to the end. There are other things people said, like the way that they do eliminations in the circle, where rather than saying anything at the time, you do a video, record the video, then people get to control it. That's not going to work. I don't think that's good at all. I think you need to have something live because so many of the great moments in that show were when people stood up on that circle and got to say something. But equally, in again, and I'm no spoilers here, but in the US series, a similar situation happens in terms of a traitor being eliminated and something they say, this time definitely not breaking the rules, and I don't even know if Kieran did, but definitely not breaking the rules, but like it could easily be inferred and it wasn't but it could easily have been inferred that ah, there's still a traitor left in the game so whether you're breaking the rules or not you've got to listen to those words so carefully especially with traitors since they have information that the rest of us don't have yeah now i would like to do a quick fire round if that's okay well i say a statement mm -hmm. and you say which of your fellow players it would most apply to and you can't say okay. yourself you gotta say one of the okay. others all right okay let's do it funniest <sighs> hannah Smartest. Ryan. Takes ages to get ready. I've got no idea. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Aisha. <laughs> if you had to be stuck in a lift for three hours with one of them. Maddie. Um, would do well in an escape room. I think I know the answer to this one. Tom. Interesting. Life of the party. Aaron. Can never make their mind up. Ooh, that's interesting. Um, I think everyone's really decisive there. Sounds like it's me by not answering. Nobody. Most determined. Wilf. Best cook. Well, I think that is me. <laughs> <laughs> um, who's cooked for me who makes delicious food? We have, we've spent some time together and we've mostly had like pizzas from the oven. Um, but I know that Will does a great steak. So I'm going to say Will because he does a great steak. <laughs> And closest friend you made on the show? Ooh, that's so difficult. That does vary, but I've had some really important hearts to heart with Maddie, and I think probably I'll say Maddie there. Awesome. Now, as you mentioned on the show, you are really into games and you even write books about them. So I was wondering what got you into games in the first place? So I was a, a, a child who got bored and my mum, who clearly saw her, a lot of herself in me, um, used play as a way for us to communicate um, when we were going about our day. So whether it was sort of coming home from school or, or, or bath time or, or kind of dinner time, she'd always be there with, with games to play. And these were sort of folk games, you know, the, the ones that you'd just be able to play as you went about your normal life. Word games, um, music games, 
um, not often deception, but more sort of strategy and, 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 and memory and that kind of thing. Um, so I have always had this kind of propensity for play and using play in real life. So therefore the boundaries between games and real life have been blurred for me for a very long time. When I went into teaching, um, I taught in primary schools for almost three years. And um, I was, I, I guess I was kind of known as the fun teacher. And part of that was because I would try and bring in play to everything we did. So we'd have, you know, massive kind of league tables based on various silly arbitrary things. We would play big games of werewolf at the end of the day, which they of course adored. Um, I would bring games and play into as much as I could, which got me in trouble at times from, from management because it was like, well, why did you do that? But I think once again, I had this kind of understanding that play is intrinsically good. Play isn't an instrument or something else. Play is it's the end in itself. Um, so when I quit teaching for various reasons and, and, and went back to writing, the first thing I tried to do was write a book of creative writing projects. But I also included as part of these projects, each one would have a couple of games that you'd play to sort of get you in the mood. And when it went out to my readers, they all said, no, no, the games are the best bit ditch the rest, just do games. So, so The Floor is Lava came out of a bunch of games that I wrote that people really, really like got into. So I expanded that to 100 games, categorized it in a fun way and sent that off to my agent who was like, this is, this is the thing, this is amazing. Um, it just felt, it didn't feel amazing to me, but it definitely felt like I was onto something. And, and the success of the book ever since has, has been a, sort of a testament to that. I've actually read some of your book, The Floor is Lava, and I was really impressed by the sheer volume of games in there. <laughs> I just like, I, I love how there's just like little ways to make life that bit more interesting. And I was wondering, how did you manage to compile so many? Yeah, that was difficult. I mean, a lot of it was to do with going back to people like my mum and just talking and just going, okay, so what did we used to do when we were here? And it, I had these different, you know, reservoirs of uh, sources of games. So I asked all my friends what games they tended to play, and I've got some really wonderfully to playful friends i wrote down all the games that i would play at dinner parties or, or when i was traveling and then i had I made, made them up as well i mean i gave myself a long time to write this book and a lot of them i just made up as, as, as we went along and tested them and saw if they worked but you're right some of them you might read it and you go is that even a game and that's that's kind of the fun of it like sometimes getting yourself into a mindset where you're already playing despite the fact that no one else in the world even knows you are, or if that feels unfair, then like just two of you are and you easily set it up and you just sat on a train. That's when play can really flourish. You don't have got to worry about mini figures and loads and loads of dice and a massive board and three and a half hours. You can just start and stop playing on a whim. And that's what the Flores Lover is. So in terms of how I collected all those games, I just put myself in a playful position for about a year and just wrote everything down that I was doing. <laughs> so just now you were mentioning Ultimate Werewolf. Now that is one of my favorite games. I play that with friends like literally every single week. And I find it's incredibly similar to the traitors. The only difference being that on the show, the faithfuls don't have any special skills like the seer or anything to identify the traitors. And I was wondering, do you feel that your experience with secret role games gave you an edge on figuring out who the traitors were? <laughs> I'd like to think so, except that I didn't do very well. By the time I was eliminated, I knew that it was Amanda and I had a very strong feeling just on the final day about Wilf and Alyssa based on some emotion, strong emotion they'd showed after that crazy breakfast, what we, we called the, the red breakfast, which I couldn't place. I couldn't figure out like why they were so emotional about it. Having said that, I also thought it was Andrea and Matt, so I wasn't all right. But yes, like playing those games enough makes you know the meaning of, so particularly the votes, right? In Ultimate Werewolf, I don't know if you play the same version, but when we do votes in Werewolf, we tend to um, accuse second and then do a majority vote. So it's not quite the same where you're voting for someone, but you're looking at the people who vote and people who don't vote and trying to make patterns out of that. Now, everyone's constantly second guessing each other. So the chaos, as we've said before, is, is very real there. You can't pin something on someone based on one vote, but patterns of voting are really important. So I, at the end of each day, would go home and memorize all the votes I could remember and write them down when I got back to my room. And by doing that, I felt I did have an edge. There were things I could do. There were sort of people I could eliminate and fully, fully sort of get out of there because of those numerical votes. The interesting thing is that if you play the game enough with people who also play the game, you will metagame constantly. When I played this game with a lot of people who hadn't played this game before, they were playing on a very different level and almost outplayed me with the simplicity of their strategies. So again, I'm, this sounds incredibly arrogant, but I guess I'm saying I can't second guess you if I haven't learn from game after game after game after game what works and what doesn't since then you go on that there's a kind of a normal pattern of 
behavior. And if you deviate from that, then you can tend to tell if someone's lying or not. No, I, I don't think it sounds arrogant at all. I totally um, get what you're saying there. As a writer myself, I really enjoy your quirky and friendly writing style in your book that I've read so far. And I was, it's, it's so easy to tell how passionate you are about what you're doing. And I was wondering what first got you into writing? Um, it's a funny story. I was a, a philosophy student at Bristol Uni and um, I started to write sort of short stories based off some philosophical thought experiments so when you're studying philosophy you go through these great thought experiments and 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 you kind of get to a, a ridiculous conclusion and it would make me laugh and it'd be like this is this is great content this is brilliant so i would sort of start to write short stories based off of these strange philosophical paradoxes and contradictions um and um sent it to an agent who said you're a bit conversational for adult short stories try, try writing for kids at first, I was a bit hurt by that. I was like, what are you talking about? I, I'm a grown up. What do you mean? But then I, I kind of got it. And it's that I, I love to have a dialogue with the reader. And that comes out as humour. It's not always intended as humour. It's intended as, as, as sort of friendship. But I love to build a relationship with the, with the reader. And what that does, of course, is it immediately breaks down any form of tension. <laughs> because what you're doing is you're making the reader feel comfortable, which is actually what I do in everything I do, in, in, in the games that I run and in, in the kind of the friendships that I keep. I'm constantly trying to make sure that the people I'm with don't feel tense or don't feel awkward. And I'm always sort of breaking down that, that thing to a fault, I'd say. So my writing style reflects that too. I'm trying to build a rapport with the reader which is funny because obviously i am when writing i'm making an inert um uh, medium right you can't act, it's not actually reactive and yet if you write in a certain way it feels reactive and that's always been my goal I, I um, did a creative writing masters last year and one of the things we learned about in literary um theory was like the um, perceived reader versus like the actual reader and like building mm. a relationship with them so that's very actually interesting hearing you, yeah. you say about that is, is literary theory something you're interested in at all or <laughs> interested but not knowledgeable i i didn't study creative writing and while i'm a great enjoyer of all sorts of different fiction i don't think i could tell you about different you know styles i couldn't necessarily tell you what sort of a writer i am um i just know that i'm a good communicator and i think that's that's one of the main things really my punctuation is terrible so you know we talk about literary theory here not grammar but i mean <laughs> my, my writing style is i would say is sort of shooting from the hip and then if i get to the end which i find really difficult then it's about reining it all in, pulling it all back, taking out all the rubbish bits and sort of seeing what's what's left over. No, I think it's very, it was very clear from what I read that like you really like to engage the reader. And I, I, love, I love when authors do that because I've got a very short attention span. So I love that like every sentence you're like pulling me back, pulling me back. So I want to keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Um, are you working on any new books at the moment? I am. I have a project that I'm working on now because I'm currently working full time with my games. I don't give myself a lot of time to write, but I've got a killer and killer is a little clue here. A killer idea for a book that I've been working on for a while, inspired by my time uh, on The Traitors. So it's not going to be about The Traitors, but it's it's focusing on the fascinating loss of agency that one feels when you've been on a show like this and then you suddenly trip back to earth. We filmed this in May, June, and no one saw it till late November. So there was sort of almost six months of a weird whiplash where we'd had this borderline traumatic event and shared it between the 22 of us. And then no one else knew about it but us. And it was so strange. And, and coming back to real life after that just felt like such a unique experience that I wanted to explain to people and express to people. So I've, I'm sort of working on a bit of a thriller based on that particular feeling of loss of agency, desperation and anxiety about what happens after, not during a show like that. Speaking of the during though, how did it feel every night going to bed knowing you might be the one murdered? Like, did that make it hard to get to sleep or? Oh yeah, it was awful. It was really, really horrible. I, I'm not, I'm not particularly one to lose sleep. I'm not, I wake up quite early, but this was ridiculous. I wouldn't be able to get to sleep. I'd toss and turn. I'd try the telly, telly on. I'd try to turn the telly off. I was trying anything to distract myself, but my mind was just racing through with all these different things. But you get so exhausted. You are so tired within a few days that in the end sleep does take over right so i know from your tiktoks that um you are a fellow board game enthusiast and i was wondering what are some of your favorite modern board games there's so much cool stuff out there what ones do you think people just have to play i have a an embarrassingly small 
collection of board games because I have for a long time had an embarrassingly small salary. Uh, it sets you back, doesn't it? I've really enjoyed playing some legacy games, Risk Legacy, Pandemic Legacy, and um, I, I love, maybe not so modern, but I love going back to, to things like, for example, Carcassonne. I cannot get over it. Um, I don't know if you, these would count as board games, but I've recently been play, playing through all of the Exit the Room games. It's by a German couple, Inkro and Marcus Brown. I love Brand. those ones. They're really, really good. I guess you could count them as a board game. They've been fantastic. Uh, and more recently I played, oh, a couple of years ago now, um, I got really into Small Worlds, which is a lovely conquer, uh, sort of Command and Conquer style, style board game. But there's a lovely combination element to it, which makes it feel a bit like a roguelike, where you're sort of, you're picking two different elements, jamming them together, and then seeing what combinations you can get. Having said that, I have a lot to learn. But the good news is I'm going to a couple of board game, con board game conventions this year. And I'm hoping I'm going to stack myself very, very high with new games that I can bring home. So tell me, what do you recommend? What should I enjoy? Oh, God. I'm putting me on the spot now. Um, one that I've been playing quite a lot is Mysterium. I don't know if you've heard of that one. I've heard so, of it. Yeah, so basically... It sounds like an inverse Cluedo mixed with a game like Dixit or Spyfall. It sounds interesting. I'm Yeah, cool. Yeah. Very nice. And if you've got uh, at least six people or more, Codenames is another really good one. So I basically, have played Yeah, I love Codenames. Basically yeah. anything that, that lets me like you. Have you played Chameleon? Yes. No, no. I've, it's uh, Big Potato. Is that who made it? No, who made it? I'm not certain who made it. I have played Chameleon. I played it at a youth club for about half an hour, and I think only only half the pieces were there. But it's, it's where one person doesn't know the... Yeah word and has to pretend they do yeah. is that what so it is yeah so basically you have like a grid with like a bunch of different words and everyone else will have the grid number except for the community who has to kind of guess which it is yeah love that so yeah. anything for you anything about lying social deduction yeah general basically deceit. like it's yeah. because, because i'm so honest in real life but i'm such a good liar because the problem is yeah. i'm a really good liar but i just get so much guilt like i cannot lie because as soon as i tell them, i'm like no that wasn't the truth but in, <laughs> case, in the game i'm just playing the role i love it <laughs> that's amazing you should have lied for the traitors no i couldn't i couldn't live with the guilt that's the thing like <laughs> apply I was, to be a faithful I, then no but i'm not gonna get live with the fear of being murdered <laughs> <laughs> because literally whenever i play werewolf they always murder me on the first night and it's just like i know i'm gonna get murdered <laughs> uh well if you're playing with the tanner then just claim to be the tanner and then never key you on the first day i was literally playing as the tanner yesterday and so mm. I was, um, I just made it seem like I was a werewolf, but then, like I was a werewolf, mm. trying not to be caught as a werewolf, and I got yeah, murdered, yeah. I was like, ha ha ha. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that you won. was not my card. <laughs> yeah. Yes! Oh, I, I love the idea that someone somewhere uh, has used that in an actual game and been like, you know, that I, I like the idea that that might be a reference that people can actually use. That would make me feel very, very smug about myself. I will endeavour to use it as a reference specifically for you from now on. Please do, thanks, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we were planning this interview, you mentioned how much you love Dungeons and & Dragons, and you seem to have very strong opinions about their new open game license, so here's the floor, expand. The thing that has kept Dungeons & Dragons so relevant since the 5th edition was released was the open game license, and the fact that people were encouraged and allowed to produce third-party content, which has made it something which can be modular and which people can add to. It's not the best tabletop role-playing game out there. It never will be the best tabletop role-playing game out there. And so for Wizards of the Coast to make movements or then make move, pretend to make, well, no, make them, but then retract them immediately as if they're going to start controlling all of that and have some sway into what gets published and what doesn't and whether it has to go through them or whether it has to be licensed was basically them cutting off their nose despite their face. It felt completely wrong. Now, I know there's been some sort of retraction, but I don't think it necessarily gets you back to where you were before, since it sends a message about how they think content made for, for Dungeons and Dragons should be treated by the licensed owners. So I think we're in a difficult position here. I think people are looking for other games to play, of which there are many, and yet, as a games master, I've got to think about the brand value of something like Dungeons and Dragons. If I try to teach a new team to play a game and I say, we're going to play Blades in the Dark, they go, okay. But if I say Dungeons and Dragons, they usually go, oh, right, yeah, no, so like, like Stranger Things. So there's like, there is this, there's this value to Dungeons and Dragons, which I think they know about. And it's an exploitation of that name it does feel like a retraction and a kind of tightening of the net. You know, we've got all the fish in the net, now we're gonna tighten it up. And I, I feel like by the time um, 1D&D &D comes out, they will have fixed this. But I don't think that the wounds that they've 
uh, dealt can be healed in terms of a mistrust for the publisher and what it means for the future of content creators. Now, I'm not a content creator in the sense of, sense of making published content, but I do use Roll20, I do use lots of homebrewed content, and I'd hate to think that those things were going to be either collared or brought in-house. Um, neither of those things are satisfying to me. When you do play D&D, what class and race do you tend to go for? Because I've only ever played one shots because I can never seem to find friends who are running a campaign. But I love being a half-elf rogue because I think it's such a fun combination. I was wondering, what's your go-to? I have played more bards than anything else, but I'm a forever DM, unfortunately, because I run so many games so i get to play very rarely um in terms of race i like the the variety i don't think i've ever played the same race twice but i've played more bards than any other character i'm interested in one D D how they're taking out the idea of a half class because every single uh playable character should in some way be a mixture a lovely mixture of different races that have come before so that's one thing in terms of you know half elf the idea that actually in a couple of years the idea of a half elf or a halfling or a half orc uh, won't really exist in that you can make it just as easily as you can make a half dwarf but the half is lizard folk you know so i like that um definitely bard bard is the important part for me uh it reflects a lot of the way i act in real life and the idea of using language or music or in any way performance to affect people is very cool there's something nice about bard and artificer which is that magic comes out of something which is not inherently magic and yet when i look at someone who's made a circuit board. It is magic because I don't understand the workings of it. And similarly, if I look at somebody playing an incredible Bach cantata, that is magic because if I tried to do it, it would just sound like notes. So when trying to understand magic and then use magic in a story to, to tell something narratively interesting, I'd much rather the source of magic be a craft or a creative skill than for example, a packed with a demon which is why i will never play and i will never play a warlock i'm just not interested sorcerer interesting similarly i don't know where i got the power from it's just here not good enough i want the magic to be a um emergent property of something that someone's really good at that's where i get i, I really get my kick i love that that's awesome like because <laughs> I, I it reminds me of how i feel when i'm watching like fantasy shows i have no problem with fantasy mm. that makes sense within the world they've built but when they just yeah. bring in some like powerful magic with no explanation of how they're getting that past like, i hate that it's like i can deal with anything that's not real but it has to be real for the world they've created you're you're so right and it's why within comics i've always been a fan of x-men and really only x-men in the marvel universe because i don't like it when oh this person got it from you know a gamma radiation blah blah, blah and this person got it from this and that it's fine fine but i'm much more interested if it's something which yeah mutation doesn't happen like that but we know mutation is real and therefore it's a much more interesting story if you keep going all right all these people have just had really wild mutations and that's the source and that's what it is you don't have to keep wondering about exactly which alien bequeathed upon you a special power. it's just i just it, the simplicity of it is much more interesting to me i definitely get that now one reason that i created screen hype is because i was so passionate to share my favorite pieces of media and i wanted to ask more about yours so like what are some of your favorite video games i know you like to play video games what are some of your absolute favorites Oh, um, that's such a good question. I have always loved the Monkey Island series. I enjoy adventure games, point and click games. Um, so, you know, things like Maniac Mansion, Sam and Max, but, but also very much, you know, Monkey Island. Every single Monkey Island game has a very special place <coughs> in my heart. And when Ron Gilbert brought out another one um, last year, I was I was absolutely playing that first first moment of, of when it came out um so that's a big recommend from me i've been really enjoying um quiet puzzle or strategy games um so just recently played uh is it case of the golden idol or curse of the golden idol one of the things of the I'm golden not idol sure. it's a lovely really really nice kind of deduction game where you look at a, a two frame murder scene it's just it's just flicking between one and the other frame and you've got to just look at the scene and figure out everyone's name and then figure out, you know, for example, where they all sat at the dining table and then figure out what is in each bottle. And by sort of dragging and dropping words and names to various different graphs, you end up piecing together the story. The task being fill in the blanks on this like closed sentence. There's a teaching phrase, closed sentence um, paragraph and get all the right words in all the right places to solve the crime. So a love, really, really lovely deduction based game. I'm not uh like gamer in the sense that i am terrible at first person shooters i I'm not, don't have quick enough um reaction times to be into fighting games 
I'm not particularly good at anything that involves like driving or racing. I love games that make me think. So, you know, um, some of the ones recently that I've just spent up to hundreds of hours in are The Witness, um, Return of the Obra Dinn, um, and I also love uh, uh, tactics games like uh, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance and um, more recently Triangle Strategy on the Switch. But the game that right now I am returning to and, and just can't seem to stop thinking about is Hades. Um, it's been it's been really important for me and actually I the year that I lost my mum which was in uh, 2020 I I played this game obsessively not realizing quite how important it is now spoilers coming up but it's been a couple of years you're battling through hell repeatedly and every time you die you're returning home and your dad is stopping you from escaping hell your dad is Hades you aren't Zagreus if you finally escape hell you realize that the person you've been battling to see is your mum. And it when I got to that point and, and escaped the overworld of Greece and sat talking to my mum, I was I remember where I was, I was sitting on the kitchen floor with my dog, and I was in floods of tears. And then of course if you played the game, you know you very soon you're back at home again and you just gotta do it again and again and again. And so it became not obsessive in a bad way, but like obsessive in a wonderful way that, that you get better and better and better at doing it each time i would sort of get to the end and be like great another three lines of dialogue with my mum and <laughs> i suddenly realized that what i was doing was like mourning through play and like that was a really really incredible moment of realization for me so that game will never not be important to me therefore every time i sort of run out of games to play i go back to hades for another few runs Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry to hear about yes. your mum, but I love that sort of That's beautiful fine. story. Like, I, I absolutely adore Hades. Like, I think the lore is just fantastic. And like you say, that emotional mm. connections you, you form with the characters, like, especially with, like, when you're Persephone, when you meet her, it's just like, oh, Ugh. it is absolutely beautiful. I'm so excited for Hades too. Have you watched the trailer for that? Yes. So I, I was trying to work out from the trailer, like, who they are, who the characters are. I imagine you'll get some of the same gods, but who's, do you know who the main character's going to be? She looks, I think it's a Shira I think there. it's a sister. I think it's a sister, based because, like, she looks so similar to Zangris when you, when you look at, like, the uh, mythology behind her and stuff. Like, I can't remember all of it because I was, like, looking into it a while ago for an article, but, like, mm. yeah, it looks like they're setting it up to be um, Zagreus's sister that he didn't know he had. But I think it's, like, his half-sister. So I think she is Hades's daughter, but not Persephone's daughter. But I'm Love not sure. That. Yeah, Do you I'm... think maybe she might be battling her way down the levels of hell rather than battling yeah. back up? Well, there was a clue on the dialogue. I, can't, I think it was some, I can't remember which of the um, gods said it, but it, um, it made it seem like it was indeed her trying to get back down into hell to mm. um, fight off. I think it was one of the titans. I think that's one of the titans has escaped. But yeah, it looks like ah. it's going to be really cool. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait. I think they did, so, it was super giant, wasn't it? I think there's yeah, such super a good giant. job building it. The mechanics are amazing and perfect. And the fact that every time you think you've sort of got a measure of the game, it opens up a whole other level of personalization. But it doesn't, I don't think I've ever done two runs that feel the same. And I must have done 150 runs by now. And I think there's something so magnificent about that. It just doesn't get boring. For roguelites to do that, means the actual play the play loop and, and and just the second by second button pushing has to feel fun they have done so much work to make it really really feedback and feel great every single second and i i it's it's that's magic right that that game is magic I actually watched a really interesting um, YouTube video about how they've got over 300,000 words of dialogue in there and the mm. algorithm they've got for the dialogue tree is just so brilliant. It means like even when you're playing like hundreds of runs, you will not get the same dialogue twice because you only get certain dialogue after doing certain things and yeah. once it's used, it's used, it's gone. Like it's just absolutely incredible how they've crafted that world. Like it's honestly fantastic. Like you, even with like AAA developers, you don't see that level of commitment to yeah. like creating such a balanced law and dialogue side of games it's all about the gameplay mm. whereas super giants have just gone so far deep in the lore it's just and the dialogue it's just absolutely fantastic there'll be combinations of things you do that that you think why would they ever even bother to write a line of dialogue for that like you pick one boon by one person then the next run you don't pick it then the next run you do but you pick someone else and they're like oh you're back and you haven't picked me for three and it's just like well why how, how did you do that i mean i know how they did it but like why did you do that but it does make it feel like the game cares about you uh, and that's a heck of a thing to feel. Absolutely. It's like such an immersive experience. Like they mm. really have thought about absolutely everything. How yeah. about TV shows? What are the things that you think my viewers should definitely check out? Oh my gosh. Well, um, 
let me see. I've been pretty obsessed with this show called The Traitors recently. <laughs> um, Traitors US is an iPlayer, and that's quite interesting. I I, I do love. Um, so I was actually looking really excited about resubscribing to Netflix and watching the second series of um, Alice in Borderland, but it was really disappointing. So I'm not. That's an anti recommend. The first series is great. It's very, you know, it's it's very Squid Gamey. It's Japanese, but it's the so it's not not Squid Game, but it, it it's got the same thing about like death games, and that's always fun. We love watching that. It's it's the same thing as watching um, Battle Royale or anything else. It's just like oh cool, you know, games with high with high stakes. They they drop the ball on series two. What else have I been watching? God, I I don't know. I've been really bad at that. Um, what a terrible answer. I have nothing to recommend in terms of in terms of TV right now. How pathetic is that? Oh, dear. I mean, cause I, I'm sad to hear about the second series of Alice in Borderland because I started mm. watching the first one and I forgot mm. what happened. Something happened to make me start watching something else. I think it was like a new series of a show I was watching mm. and I need to get back to it. And now it's like, oh, second season is going to be disappointing. That is that is a shame. Hey, don't take my word for it. Maybe I'm not the best judge. I just I just felt it was a bit too self-indulgent and it wasn't believable. And there's that other thing where in a game where you immediately set the parameters at the beginning of the game, at the beginning of the show of like, oh, pretty much everyone's died. You're on your own here. And then they keep bringing in people to kill. It's just like, can you just not? Like, we don't need 60 people to die in this scene. If you only believe there were 30 people alive in the entire world, just kill off five of them. Don't bring in 30 just to kill 35. It, I just I just felt like it, you had to keep giving it such artistic license that in the end, it just, I just got tired. I don't want to feel like that. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Um, I was going to recommend you something just now. I forgot what it was. Oh, please. You say you like mysteries. Have you seen the Harlan Coben ones? Um, Safe, and I forgot what the other one is. There's two Harlan Coben books that are adapted to TV shows, I think it was last year, and they were just absolutely phenomenal mysteries. This is great. Thank you. So Safe Safe and... is, I, I will Instagram you the other one because I can't remember what it's called off okay. my head, but they're like, they're like um, sort of limited series. So I think it's eight episodes per thing, and it fills the entire sort of mystery, and they're fantastically acted. The plot is just so like I could not stop watching. I slept, sat down in the morning, watched until the evening because I could not stop. It was that's absolutely fantastic. incredible. No, that's you, brilliant. I think you would love them. This time of year, in the run up to the Oscars, I start to watch all of those Oscar films, and um, we haven't got very far through them yet. But um, we did just watch Glass Onion, which is which is so great. <laughs> I was and... literally about to say as well. If you've got Netflix, yeah, you get that Glass Onion. I mean, it's it's such fun. It, it's some some of the some of the lines, you know, really really made me laugh. I think it was when it became clear that Dave Bautista's character had a Google alert for the word movies. I just I, I just had to pause. I was laughing so hard I had to literally pause it. It was just like, <laughs> um, it's it's great. I mean, as mysteries go, it's it's standard fare. But the, the the social commentary and satire is is spot on. So that's that's a good one. Yeah, no, definitely. Like, I just think the casting in that one is just so perfect. Like, they just bounce off each other so well. Like, in the How many races, films... you just bounce off each other so well. I know, I know. It's so good. <laughs> How many films in the next three years do you think will have not even close to um, cloaked satires of Elon Musk? I feel like that's going to be, every film has to have one now, right? <laughs> yeah, obviously. Um, <laughs> I, I just think, I, just, I, I love when they do sort of do satirical things of people like Elon Musk or Trump or anything like that. Like, have you seen The Boys? I've read the boys. Ah, okay. The... I comics, yeah. Garth Ennis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, because um, in season three, without giving away too many spoilers, they take one of the characters and they make him so similar to Donald Trump, and it's scary how accurate it is, because they're always so on it with political commentary, and Love it's that. just absolutely scary how... how uh... <laughs> also, if you haven't seen it, you have to watch it. It's amazing. Yeah, I think I, think I will. It's, I, it's definitely Prime. It's, it's one of those ones that I've had on my list for a while. I'm, yeah, no, I'm, it's definitely I'm making a list, it. Malika, right now. <laughs> No, honestly, I think you would love that. What, what else? Because I think it's, I don't know what other shows you, you like because you gave like one recommendation. I know, isn't that terrible? Like. So it's like because I don't want to give you recommendations so you won't like. Ah, oh, it's just like a lot of pressure. Do you know what? It's okay because I, I'm a busy boy, and I, I, that, you've already given me plenty. That's great. I've Perfect. come away from this call with more than I left. So yeah, that's good. There we go. Right now, before we go, I would love to do a game with you. Actually, two nice. truths and a lie, because okay. being a traitor involves being able to lie convincingly. So I see mm -hmm. how well you do. So give me two, sta three statements, two of which are true, one of which is a lie. And I'm gonna try and figure out the lie. Okay. <clears throat> I appeared on TV with a broken jaw. I appeared on TV playing a left-handed piano. 
I appeared on TV getting custard pied by Lenny Henry. Okay. I mean, I didn't know a left-handed piano existed, but that feels like the kind of thing you wouldn't make up something that doesn't exist. So we've got Broken Jaw, Left-Handed Piano, and Custard Pie by Lenny Henry. So the Custard Pie by Lenny Henry one feels like something so ridiculous that you wouldn't say it unless it was true, but then you could be double bluffing me. Like you said, you said all of them are so straight-faced, it makes it much harder. <laughs> um, hmm. I think the Left-Handed Piano is true based on the fact that I don't think i think like it just it feels so out there without being too out there as much as the custard pie one and then it's a case of whether the custard pie by lenny henry one <sighs> this is tricky i'm gonna say that the lenny henry one is the false one you're correct yes. well done you did really well <laughs> oh dear you, have you, you got, got one for me oh okay oh gosh okay I have, I have. <laughs> now i have all right okay so when I was a child, Sir Patrick Stewart came to our school. I once beat the chaser on ITV's The Chase. I once stroked a tiger. Ooh, very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay, so the first thing I'm thinking is I name dropped a national treasure, and so did you. And mine was a lie. That's not going to help me too much because it does feel like something that Sir Patrick Stewart would do. And it may be that you thought of it because I mentioned Lenny Henry. Stroking a tiger, it can be done. People have done that. Beating the chaser, I think you'd like to tell me you beat the chaser. So I think maybe that one is true. Unless you went on the chase and got beaten by the chaser. But I th no, I think you beat the chaser. I think you've gone for, say the same sort of lie as Ivan did. I think the lie is Sir Patrick Stewart. Oh, it is. It was actually yes! <laughs> It was actually Ian McKellen who came to my school to give an assembly. Oh, you got me good. <laughs> that was good. No, I, I I see what you were doing there and I was almost taken in by I almost went for Tiger as the most believable of the three. But, I should have um, made up a different lie and oh, you're too which, good. Which which chaser did you beat? Jenny. It was her first season. To be fair, like we did do well, but she had a really bad off day. We only got sixteen, like any other chaser we would have gone out. But we didn't. Well so. done. Brilliant <laughs> stuff. You did great. Oh, dear. this has been so much fun. Thank you so much oh, for yeah. doing this, Ivan. Thank you. Bye. Bye.